Okay, so I said last week I was going to give you some little background on uh, eschatology. That's the study of end times. And I want to read, first of all, from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. There's a very important and significant prophecy there. You'll find in conjunction with the uh, prophetic passages in the Gospels, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and so forth, um, and the book of Revelation, which we're now studying, the book of Daniel is one of the most important books in the Bible uh, for understanding prophecy or eschatology. And so here in Daniel 12, beginning in verse 1, the angel is giving Daniel this end times prophecy. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. And Michael, of course, is an archangel. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And that's exactly what Jesus said in the Gospels. I've got that stupid coffee mug here again that always gives me trouble. Jesus said that in the Gospels, that the time of the tribulation would be unlike any other time in human history. And he meant that in a negative way. In other words, it would be more horrible than any other time in human history. And all the, this current pandemic has been quite trying in all actuality, in all honesty. There have been worse times in the past. But in terms, I think I said this last week or the week before, in terms of the end times, the tribulation, what we're seeing now is the tip of the iceberg. Because we all know. Now, there's a lot of debate over this current virus. Is it man-made? Is it naturally occurring? Was it done on purpose? Was it an accident? We all know that all the major nations in the world have bio weapons laboratories, do we not? They're all developing dangerous, deadly viruses uh, with the intent of at some point possibly using them as a weapon. That was the big issue when uh, President Bush invaded Afghanistan and then Iraq, weapons of mass destruction. And now it's looking like perhaps the most effective and most dangerous weapon of mass destruction is something like this Wuhan virus. But whether it was intentional, it was leaked. Can you imagine if several of these all began to circulate at the same time. Not just one, like we have now. Whether they're released intentionally, whether they're... Now, there were some that were speculating that uh, China already has the vaccine, and that's why their numbers were so low com comparative to their population. Of course, others say they lied about the numbers. You know, there's so much we don't know, right? But what we do know is in this modern world we live in, and we're going to touch on this in a moment here in um, verse 4 of Daniel 12, that whereas 100 years ago, 200, 500, 1,000, there could be an epidemic, pandemic. Well, pandemic really implies worldwide. We used to use the term pan uh, epidemic because these things tended to be more isolated because we didn't have all the forms of mass rapid transit that we have where so many people are crammed in together. But now that we do have that, a lot of the majority of this virus was spread through air travel. People getting infected and then traveling on an airplane, going from point A to point B. Let's continue on here with Daniel. A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And that time being the time we're now living in, I believe, we're in the last days. Daniel uh, was receiving this message from the angel about the time you and I are living in. Think about that. Over 6,000 years of human history, we're living in the time that all the prophets spoke of. It's pretty amazing. And I, I think it's pretty much indisputable that we are. And at that time, your people, now this would be the Jews, because obviously Daniel was Jewish, 
At that time, your people shall be delivered. Now, we know according to the Scriptures, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel. We love the Jews. We love God's chosen people. We love the land of Israel. But unfortunately, according to the Scriptures, they are going to endure another persecution even worse than the Holocaust of World War II. I wish it wasn't true, but it is. But there will be a deliverance for Israel when Jesus comes back. And the faithful remnant will be gathered to him along with all the Gentile believers. Everyone who is found written in the book, the Lamb's book of life, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now this is really important. I talk about this a lot. But the angel confirms it here to Daniel. Some to everlasting life. Notice this. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everyone gets raised, but not everyone lives forever. There is eternal life in Christ, and there is eternal torment apart from Him. I call it an eternal conscious state of existence, but it's not life. Life is only found in God, only found in Christ. But those who are betting against all odds that the worst case scenario is uh, there's no heaven, no hell, and so I just get to go to sleep forever and never be held accountable for my actions here on earth. It doesn't work that way. Everyone will be held accountable. The only difference is if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, He paid the price for you. He took the penalty in your place. You will never be punished for your sins. Not because you don't deserve to be, but because of His love, grace, and mercy and forgiveness. Verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. I've talked about this before. We are the children of the light, the Bible says. And yet it's interesting, part of this end times mass deception, the UFO crowd... And now our own government is confirming that there are UFOs. Have you heard that? They're coming right out and admitting it. But guess what? Those UFOs are not aliens. They're fallen angels. Some may be God's angels passing in and out of this dimension. And that's indicative of increased angelic activity, which again correlates with the last days. There's a great battle on the horizon between God's forces and the forces of darkness. But part of this great end times deception that the Bible talks about has to do with this embracing of so-called alien beings. Did you know that the Catholic Church, the Vatican, they have this gigantic telescope down by Tucson, Arizona. I forget the name of the mountain that it's on. But the letters of the name of this telescope spell out, this is, this is no joke, this is real, look it up, Lucifer. And now each letter stands for something and altogether it describes the nature of this gigantic telescope and it's called Lucifer. And the Catholic Church is actually watching for aliens through the telescope. And their plan, check this out, read all, Tom Horn's writings, read um, you know, uh, Steve, what's his name? Dad, I forgot his name. What is it? I can't hear you. Steve Quayle. Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, uh, L.A. Marzulli, who's spoken here more than once. These guys are all on top of this stuff. Their plan, check this out, is to baptize the aliens. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I guess they'll baptize anybody. Anyway, there is a worldwide deception coming, tying into this stuff. The reason I mention it is, if you Google the term beings of light, remember the Bible says Satan masquerades as an angel of light, right? We are going to be the real beings of light. Those who are wise, 
And what makes a person wise? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. So you and I, remember when Moses went up onto, oh, I get to move around again. Hello. All right. <laughs> remember when Moses went up onto Mount Sinai and he came down and his face was glowing? He had to cover it up because he, you know, he felt weird about that. We're all going to be glowing because we're going to dwell forever in the light of the Lord. But right now, if you Google the term beings of light on the internet, you'll get something like, I forget now, it was, this was quite a while ago, four million hits. And not one of them have anything to do with Christians. Those beings of light, the New Age people, the UFO people, all the different streams of deception are looking for these beings of light to come and enlighten us. You see, Satan's strategy is he wants to get a hold of people's hearts and minds and deceive them and usurp the power and the authority of God. He knows that Jesus is going to establish his millennial kingdom here on the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. But somehow, he is a highly intelligent being, the devil, but somehow he's not smart enough to realize he can't possibly defeat Jesus Christ. But that's his goal. He wants to usurp the power and authority of Jesus Christ and establish his kingdom upon the earth, the one world government. Oh, is it starting to look like that? One world economy, is it starting to look like that? Ooh. One world religion? It'll be an all-inclusive religion. The only part that won't be included is Jesus, Jesus Christianity, right? You'll have, you know, the tinfoil hat folks right next to the, to the Muslims with their burqas, and it'll all be one big happy family, but no Christians. You saw that video sometime back that I showed where the Pope brought all those different religious leaders together, the Muslim imam and the Buddhist. And the, remember? And he was promoting this universalist religious belief. All pathways lead to heaven. Right? Universalism. Boy, that tr stomps all over the blood of Christ, doesn't it? To say that you can get there by all these other means. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Only one name given under heaven by which man must be saved. <clears throat> I probably won't get past the introduction today, by the way. Uh, okay. But you're used to that, right? All you watching at home, I'm back in the groove now, so no more short messages. <laughs> Okay, and those who turn many to righteousness, those of us who witness, share our faith, bring others to Christ, like the stars forever and ever. So we will be the true beings of light. We're the children of the light. We're the children of the day. It does not yet appear what we shall be, it says in the book of Romans. But we know what we shall be because the scriptures tell us. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. And so, until the time of the end. So you see, for the last nearly 3,000 years, I don't believe there's been a full and complete understanding of these prophetic scriptures. The angel told Daniel it would be closed until the time of the end. And what would that time look like? Many shall run to and fro. What does that mean? That means traveling at a rate of speed never known before. From 20 miles per hour 100 years ago. Think about that. To 20,000 miles per hour in a space shuttle. You think this might be the to and fro time? Travel halfway around the world in 12 to 14 hours on a jet airplane? So, again, now you can carry all kinds of things 
halfway around the world in a half a day, including viruses and knowledge and information, technology. I think it was last week that I mentioned, I believe, that we have returned to the Tower of Babel. The modern-day Tower of Babel is technology. It's the Internet. Man is building his tower thinking he can become God, and God's not going to let that happen. But by the end of the tribulation, man will have taken himself to the very brink of extinction. And Jesus said, unless the days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. That means you better have a plan for eternity, right? The time of the end, many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall increase. Knowledge is increasing at such a rapid rate. Now the moment you buy a piece of electronic equipment, it's almost immediately obsolete. So fast. All right, I want to give you some different eschatological terminology here before we move forward in the book of Revelation. So again, we, I don't know if we're even going to get to any of the Revelation scriptures today, but uh, we'll see how... Oh, actually, that clock, I can never read that thing properly. It's weird. We're doing better, way better than I thought. Anyway, so the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Not all people who identify as Christians believe in that. Did you know that? Let me read you the different viewpoints on the millennium. First of all, there's awe millennialism. In Christian eschatology, it involves the rejection of the belief that Jesus will have a literal thousand-year-long physical reign on the earth. All millennialists don't believe in the millennium. This rejection contrasts with the premillennial and some postmillennial interpretations of chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. So for the all millennial, there is no millennium. They don't believe in it. Then there's postmillennialism. In Christian end times theology or eschatology, postmillennialism is an interpretation of chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, which sees Christ's second coming as occurring after the millennium. It doesn't seem quite right, does it? A golden age in which Christian ethics prosper. The term subsumes several similar views of the end times, and it stands in contrast to premillennialism and to a lesser extent, ah, millennialism. Postmillennialism holds that Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom on earth through his preaching and redemptive work in the first century, and that he equips his church with the gospel, empowers her by the Spirit, and charges her with the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, to disciple all nations. Postmillennialism expects that eventually the vast majority of men living will be saved. Increasing Gospel success will gradually produce a time in history prior to Christ's return in which faith, righteousness, peace, and prosperity will prevail in the affairs of men and of nations. After an extensive era of such conditions, Jesus Christ will return visibly, bodily, and gloriously to end history with the great, uh, the general resurrection of, and the final judgment after which the eternal order follows." This is commonly referred to now as dominion theology. That before Christ returns, we believers are going to conquer the world for Jesus. Now, we've had 2,000 years. How's it going? Dominion theology. So let me get into that a little bit. Or also known as kingdom now. And when you see some of these TV preachers and different ones spouting on and on and on about a great revival, getting everybody all pumped up, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't correlate with the real world. There are little revivals that break out in various parts of the world all the time. It's exciting when you see a group of people coming to Christ. But I do not believe the Bible teaches a great end times worldwide global revival. The Bible teaches a great end times falling away, and we're seeing it before our very eyes. 
Dominion theology is a theocratic ideology that seeks to implement a nation governed by conservative Christians ruling over the rest of society based on their understanding of biblical law. So it's almost like a, a Christian version of the Old Testament theocracy. <laughs> and what you have in these Muslim nations is they have their own style of theocracy, supposedly under the rule of Allah, Sharia law. Dominion theology is related to theonomy, though it does not necessarily advocate Mosaic law as the basis of government. Prominent adherents of Dominion theology are otherwise theologically diverse, including the Calvinist Christian Reconstructionism. You've heard my take on Calvinism more than once. And by the way, two-thirds of the churches in America today are Calvinist to one degree or another. And that explains because Calvinist theology embraces replacement theology which means the Calvinists believe that Israel no longer matters, that God has done with them. He's cast them aside and replaced Israel with us. It's also called white Israelism. Calvinist Christian Reconstructionism and the charismatic Pentecostal Kingdom Now theology and the new apostolic reformation. And all of this is tied into replacement theology and yet, those who bless Israel will be, what? Blessed. And those who curse Israel will be? God has never revoked that, by the way. And he's never revoked the fact that, he, that Israel is the apple of his eye. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That was Paul's message. And yet we have these theologies that have woven their way into the universal Church of Christ, the body of Christ, that sows seeds of hatred and rejection for God's chosen people. And you'll find in many of the more liberal churches that they champion the cause of the Palestinians and um, denigrate the Jews. Suppressionism, got two more, suppressionism and then, no, three more. Suppressionism, also called replacement theology or fulfillment theology, is a Christian theological view. See how these kind of piggyback on one another. It's a Christian theological view on the current status of the church in relation to the Jewish people and Judaism. Suppressionism. It holds that the Christian church has replaced the Israelites as God's chosen people and that the new covenant has replaced or superseded the Mosaic covenant. From a suppressionist point of view, just by continuing to exist, the Jews dissent. This view directly contrasts with dual covenant theology, which holds that the Mosaic covenant remains valid for the Jews. So that's another one out there, dual covenant. I don't know if it's true or not, but I had heard that John Hagee had embraced dual covenant theology. Anybody know if that's true? Dual covenant theology teaches that Jews don't have to receive Jesus to be saved. That's not biblical either. You see how many different variants are going on out there and how easy it is for people to get deceived? It's really scary. We have to stay in the Word. We have to rightly divide the Word of truth. We can't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine as it talks about in the book of Ephesians. And vast numbers of people in the church are doing exactly that. They're tossed about by every wind of doctrine, every new fad doctrine that comes down the pike. If we just stick to the Scriptures, we will be fine. But we have to stick to the Scriptures and not every different individual interpretation. In fact, Peter said no Scripture is of private interpretation. And yet that's pretty much what every one of these groups promote. Well, we know the, the real inside scoop. And if you, if you want to know the real deal, you've got to hook up with us. That's a cultic attitude. Supersession formed a core tenet of the church for the majority of its existence. That explains a lot. The, the Spanish Inquisition... All the horrible things that have been done to the Jews over the last 2,000 years 
and the horrible things that have been done to Christians who refused to toe the party line. The Christians who did stick to the truth of God's Word were often persecuted and martyred for that. Supersessionism formed a core tenet of the church. I have great admiration for Martin Luther departing from the Catholic Church, the Protestant Reformation, but in his later years he became a vehement anti-Semite. Did you know that? And Adolf Hitler based a lot of what he did on the latter teachings of Martin Luther. See, it's not enough to start well, we need to finish well. And sadly, I've seen over and over again that great men and women of the faith who started out well, as they got older and older, they seemed to get more and more liberal. I don't understand why. Pastor Chuck Smith never did. But many others, I won't name any names today, but I've observed it. How they become more and more lax, more and more tolerant more and more compromising. Paul says, I've finished the race set before me. And that's what you and I need to do as well. It's not enough to look back at the good old days and say, well, I started out really well. We've got to finish the race. Now, since the Holocaust... Oh, let me finish this last phrase here. So, supersessionism formed a core tenet of the church for the majority of its existence and remains a common assumption among Christians. Again, that supersessionism, meaning that we have superseded the Jews. They're out of the equation now. They're they're out the door. And you see, if you are a supersessionist, if you're a kingdom now person, if you're a, you know, um, what was my other term? Man, my memory is not what it used to be. Um, replacement theology. If you embrace those things and you reject that God still has a plan for His chosen people. Here's the deal, folks. One third of all Scripture is prophecy. And if you leave Israel out, you're never going to understand it because they're right at the heart of it. The heart of prophetic Scripture is God's plan for Israel. That's why we won't be here for the rapture. The purpose of the tribulation is twofold, maybe threefold. But first of all, the tribulation is to pour out God's wrath, His judgment on an unbelieving world, just like Noah's flood, like Sodom and Gomorrah. God is long-suffering. He's patient, not willing that any should perish. But as we've seen in times past, at some point God's patience runs out because His perfection demands justice. And so, for an unbelieving world, a wicked world, there's going to come a point very soon where God's going to say, okay, that's, that's the end of it. I'm drawing the line right here. It's time for wrath. Wrath. Wrath is never for believers. Did you know that? He's not appointed us to suffer wrath. Persecution, yes. Believers have always been persecuted. God uses it to strengthen us, to build endurance, to, to validate our faith. How is our faith validated when everything's peachy keen all the time? Peaches and cream? Piece of cake? Our faith is validated by how we respond to trials and tribulations. And if, unfortunately, many people turn away at that point, right? Trials will make you bitter or better, right? But see, trials, tribulations persecutions are not the same thing as wrath. God's wrath always has been and always will will be reserved for non-believers, the wicked, the unrepentant. First reason for the tribulation, seven years, is the outpouring of God's wrath on an unbelieving world. But in order to do that, he first has to remove his own. Because we're not appointed to suffer wrath. And we're believers. We're not unbelievers. And so we will be removed, and then the outpouring of God's wrath will begin. That's the first reason for the tribulation. The second reason is the restoration of Israel. 
But if you're a replacement theology person, if you're a Calvinist, if you're a dominion theology person, a kingdom now theology person, a supersessionist, and you don't believe God has a plan for Israel anymore, then that just blows the whole prophecy thing apart. None of it even makes sense anymore. Because at the heart of it all is God's restoration of Israel. Our Messiah is Jewish. Did you know that? (laughs) Yeshua HaMashiach, he's Jewish. I think I'll have a sip of coffee. It's probably not warm and hot anymore. Warm. So I want to tell you, for starters, if you have a desire to understand biblical prophecy, then you need to embrace the Jewish people, God's chosen people, the apple of his eye, and bless them because they're at the heart of God's plan. And you see, you and I are grafted in. The Bible teaches. Now there is neither Jew nor Greek, you know, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ. We've been grafted into the vine of Israel. So to reject them is to reject ourselves. <clears throat> Since the Holocaust, some mainstream Christian theologians and denominations have rejected supersessionism. Some. Like I just said, two-thirds of the churches in America are Calvinistic. And you will find those churches to be liberal and anti-Israel. That means that you and I, who love Israel, who love the Jews, who support them, who do not believe that they have been superseded by the church, are in the minority. And by the way, as we'll be teaching throughout this series in Revelation, that the rapture of the church occurs before the tribulation, at the beginning of it, That makes us in the minority as well. But have you noticed that usually it's not that great of an idea to follow the majority? Have you noticed that? So I'm proud to say that I am part of the minority. Last time I checked, I think Jesus and his disciples were in the minority. Don't you think? Okay, preterism. As a Christian eschatological view uh, interprets some, there's partial preterism or all prophecies. So some preterists are partial preterists, some are full preterists, and they believe that the prophecies of the Bible as events which have already happened. In other words, it's a, all prophecy has already taken place. This school of thought interprets the book of Daniel as referring to events that happened in the 2nd century B.C. while seeing the prophecies of Revelation as events that happened in the 1st century A.D. So in other words, by the time John finished writing the book of Revelation and died at a ripe old age towards the end of the 1st century, all the stuff had already happened. Preterism holds that ancient Israel finds its continuation or fulfillment in the Christian church at the destruction of Israel in A.D. 70. So again, there's some more supersessionism in there, some more replacement theology. The term preterism comes from the Latin preter, which Webster's 1913 dictionary lists as a prefix denoting that something is past or beyond. So preterism believes that all of the prophecies of Scripture are past. None are future. <clears throat> Preterism teaches that either all or a majority of Bible prophecy had come to pass by 70 A.D. Adherents of preterism are commonly known as preterists. All right, I have one more term for you. This is premillennialism. I saved the best for last. In Christian eschatology, premillennialism is the belief that Jesus will physically return to the earth before the millennium, because honestly, how can you have a millennium without Jesus? You know, for some who, who believe that we're already in it, I'm saying, man, that's a big disappointment. 
this is one heck of a millennium, I got to tell you. Premillennialism believes he will return before the millennium because he will kick off the millennium. A literal thousand year golden age of peace. I haven't seen that around here lately, have you? And yet some have taught that we're already in it. Crazy. This return is referred to as the second coming. And as Pastor Chuck Smith always used to say, the plain thing is the main thing. And then, of course, there's a whole other subject of pre, mid, post, tribulation, and rapture. Some believe, those who do believe in the rapture are in the minority, but even within that camp, some believe it'll happen before the tribulation, some believe it'll happen halfway through, and some believe it doesn't happen until the end. I've been a pre-tribber throughout my lifetime as a believer. That is the officially accepted doctrine of Calvary Chapel, at least under the leadership of Chuck Smith. Now, with his departure, there's a splintering going on within the Calvary Chapel movement, and uh, more and more pastors, particularly the younger ones, are departing from this belief. But I will continue to hold my belief in the pre-tribulation rapture until I go up before the tribulation. And if you're still here, would you please take care of my dog, Buddy? <laughs> now, many have overanalyzed Revelation, I believe. Many have underanalyzed it. Many have said it should not be studied because it's too difficult to understand. That kind of leaves out the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Too difficult? Would God have given us these scriptures if they were too difficult to understand? No, He gave them to us. Because he made them understandable so that we might know him. We might know about him and we might know him. And he has revealed all things to us, at least to the degree that we're able to understand and accept. Though others have said we shouldn't study it because it's divisive, it's a distraction. And yet we saw, in fact, I've even met pastors who have said... The book of Revelation should not even be in the Bible. We did a concert one time here in New Mexico, probably 40 years ago or more. I believe it was somewhere like Artesia, memory serves me collect, correct. And the pastor said, there's only two things I don't want you to do. Because he knew we were going to talk, we weren't going to just sing, you know. We were going to witness, testify. He said, I don't want you to give an altar call. I don't want you to invite people to accept Christ. Here we are in a so-called Christian church. We're an evangelistic music group, but we're not supposed to give an invitation. And then the other thing was, don't talk about the book of Revelation. So what did we do? We talked about the book of Revelation, and we gave an altar call, because <laughs> that's how you do it. That was the one and only time we played and sang in that church. So we had to make the most of every opportunity, right? And yet these people say, oh, it's too hard to understand. It's too divisive. It's a distraction. Shouldn't even be in the Bible. And yet what did we see probably week before last? Revelation 1.3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. It's the only book in the whole Bible that has a promise like this. And we're not supposed to study it? you got to read it, and then to hear it means that you apply it to your heart. It passes from an intellectual understanding to a heart knowledge, and then to keep those things, you follow them. You let them impact your life, the way you live, the way you think. Only, and this is the only book in the Bible that has that kind of a promise. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And then Matthew 24, 33, so you also, when you see all these things, Jesus said, know that it is near at the doors. In my personal opinion, Jesus is at the door. Let's pray and we're going to get into a little bit of revelation here. Father God, thank you for this uh, information that's available to us to, to know and understand the thinking of people 
that identify as Christians, those under the umbrella of the church, and yet there's so many different viewpoints. But Lord, we only want one viewpoint. We want your viewpoint. Lord, and as Pastor Chuck said, the plain thing is the main thing. Some people try to twist and manipulate things to mean what they want them to mean, but we want to know what you mean. And we want to to read it, hear it, and take it to heart to, to apply it to our lives. We ask you to help us do that as we continue this study in Revelation. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. So we're going to pick it up in verse 10 of chapter 1. I don't know why I'm not feeling this fan. Is, is anyone else warm? Are you hot? No, just me. Don't worry, I don't have a fever. <laughs> you know me, I'm always hot. And ew, I got this. Yeah. That thing's making me hotter. Well, even Wuhan Gruesome said I didn't have to wear it when I preached, so. Are you offended that I call her that? I'm just I'm just being playful. You know? Just being playful. I love you, Michelle. In the, in the love of the Lord. Okay, verse 10. Uh-oh, my mic's not properly mounted. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. In the Spirit. <clears throat> so on the day, he says on the Lord's day, on the day that the New Testament Christians had set aside for worship, John was in a state of deep communion with the Holy Spirit. This phrase, in the Spirit, is used four times in the book of Revelation. Now, Ezekiel had a similar experience. Ezekiel 3.12, The Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from His place. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels beside them. And see, Ezekiel had a vision of God's chariot of fire traveling through space with the cherubim there. He was lifted up in the spirit. Noise of the wheels beside them and a great thunderous noise. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So God gives Ezekiel a vision of what's going to happen to Jerusalem during the Babylonian invasion. And John says, I was in the Spirit, just like Ezekiel, because this whole thing that's unfolding here in Revelation is a massive vision that God gives to John. And no doubt being in the Spirit involved prayer and meditation. Ephesians 6.18, pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being to watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So John says, I was in the Spirit. This wasn't just some, you know, uh, bad anchovies that he got off the beach there in Patmos. He's in the Spirit. Just like Ezekiel was lifted up in the Spirit. It was on the Lord's Day. Again, uh, there are those today that claim we should be worshiping on Saturday. That we're not accurately observing the Sabbath when we worship on Sunday. Guess what? The Bible says we're supposed to worship every day. And that Jesus is our Sabbath. He's the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Paul said some men view certain days as special. Other men view every day the same. It's up to the conviction of your own heart. And there are some people who are convicted that they need to worship on Saturday, and so be it. But there's no doubt in my mind that when John says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, he's talking about Sunday, the Lord's Day, because he rose from the dead on this day. That changed everything. 
If it was the Sabbath, I believe John would have said, I was in the Spirit on the Sabbath. Because he was still Jewish, although he was a born-again believer, and he was set free from the law. If he had been in the Spirit on the Sabbath, I believe he would have said that. I believe this is Sunday. Not that it really makes that much difference. <coughs> the point is, no one should judge us for worshiping on Sunday. We should not worship, uh, judge anyone else for worshiping on Saturday. And the fact of the matter is, we should worship every day. I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Here John begins the use of symbolic language that sets the tone for what's to come. We know there's just oodles of symbolic language in the book of Revelation, and that's what we're going to decipher and break down as we go through. And the trumpet, of course, identifies directly with the rapture of the church, which we'll see at the beginning of chapter 4. I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Matthew 24, 31, he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and then will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Finally, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And that's the passage where, where we're caught up to meet him in the air. As I've said so many times, the rapture is Jesus coming for the saints. The second coming is Jesus coming with the saints. The first time, he stops in midair and calls us up to meet him. At the second coming, we all come back with him as the clouds of heaven. And we come with him as he single-handedly defeats the armies of the Antichrist and the armies of the kings of the earth. All right, verse 11, saying, this voice, this loud voice like the sound of a trumpet is saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, John, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. What you see, <clears throat> write in a book or write on a scroll what you see. And that would be the more likely scenario that he would have been using a scroll. But notice here, Jesus is telling him to write down what he sees. Jesus' revelation to John is more visual than it is verbal. God's going to give him a motion picture presentation. Talk about a blockbuster. Wouldn't you like to see that one? Maybe we'll get to watch it in heaven. Get to watch that motion picture that God showed John. And I'm sure it was in technicolor. What you see right in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia or Anatolia or Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Asia, not China, not Cambodia, Vietnam, any of that, Korea. No, this would have been Turkey. And we'll learn about all of these seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So apparently, John wasn't initially looking in the direction that the voice was coming from. And so long before the TV show, The Voice, John had an encounter with the voice, the voice of Jesus. So he turns to see who's speaking to him. He sees seven golden lampstands. These represent the seven churches mentioned in verse 11, and we'll see them again in verse 20. Now, a golden lampstand with three branches extending from either side of the central tier was placed in the tabernacle in Israel, Exodus 25, 31 through 40. Each branch may have had a seven-spouted lamp, Zechariah 4, 2, as some individual lamps in Israel do. The seven-branched menorah, you know about the menorah, supporting seven lamps was used in both the first and second temples. 
later became a symbol of the nation of Israel or symbolic of the nation of Israel. A lot of people, when they go on a trip to Israel, they bring back a menorah. We have one at home. It's kind of cool. With God's rejection of Israel and the Jews' rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, the New Testament Gentile church has become the light of the world. That was God's intention for Israel, that they would be a light to the world. But we know that they fell away. They had a great falling away, and they rejected Jesus as a nation. Individually, many in Israel became followers of Christ. But officially, as a nation, the rulers, the leaders of Israel rejected him, called out for him to be crucified, and the majority of the people went along with it. There were 120 faithful followers in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Verse 13, In the midst of the seven lampstands, John sees one with a big O, like the Son of Man. Remember when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel? And uh, they threw them in. It was so hot, the furnace was so hot, that the guards who threw them in were consumed by the flames. And yet they looked down there, and there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hava Nagila, you know? And, and they said... Wait a minute, there's four people down there, and one of them looks like the Son of Man. Do you remember that? How cool is that? Jesus was there. You know what? If you ever find yourself in a place in life where you feel like you're in the fiery furnace, guess who's right there with you? Jesus. Jesus. So this phrase is used to, in reference to Jesus. Check this out. 82 times in the four Gospels, he is referred to as the Son of Man. That's a lot of times. And it's indicative of the humanity of Christ. It's important for, to God for us to understand that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He suffered in every way as you and I, and yet without sin. You see, before Christ came, even those who believed in God, it was a struggle because he seemed so distant, so far away, unknowable, unseeable. And so he became tangible. God became a man. He, in John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest, with a golden band. Now this attire, his clothing represents him as both priest and judge. So we go back to Daniel for a moment. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, Daniel says, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Hello, this guy gets around, doesn't he? You know, in the Old Testament, it talks about in numerous places the angel of the Lord. Have you ever read those scriptures? It doesn't say, sometimes it'll say an angel from the Lord. But when it says the angel of the Lord, guess who that is? It's called a Christophany or a Theophany. It's a pre-incarnate appearance by Jesus Christ as the angel of the Lord. The son of man, he gets around. Reminds me of that Beach Boys so song, I Get Around. If they thought they got around, it's nothing compared to Jesus. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Hello. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His, this is, the, folks, do you know what Daniel's talking about here? The second coming, where Jesus is given all dominion, all glory. He's given a kingdom. All peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall never be destroyed. And once again, he's mentioned as the Son of Man. 
Verse 14 of Revelation 1, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and His eyes like a flame of fire. Now, Jesus was only 33 when He died and rose, right? So how come He has white hair? His white snowy hair represents His wisdom and purity. Daniel 7, go back a few verses, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Uh, you know, God's a fiery God. Did you know that? There was fire and smoke up on Mount Sinai when Moses would go up to meet with... The Mount Sinai would quake and shake, and there would be fire and smoke, and all the people were scared to death. And only Moses had the courage to go up there and meet with God. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. The Ancient of Days. Jesus is the Ancient of Days. He is God and he is the judge of all. Back to Revelation 1, verse 14. His eyes like a flame of fire. Fire represents two things. Purification. We know when they're, we sing a song sometimes, it's one of the older worship songs, it's a good one, Refiner's Fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy, purify my heart. So when you're refining precious metals, gold and silver and so forth, they do it by heating that metal up, then all the impurities rise to the surface, they are skimmed off and you have a pure silver, a pure gold, Right? So for those who know God and love God, we will encounter the fire of God, but it'll be a good thing because it'll be a purifying fire. But fire also represents judgment. His eyes like a flame of fire. His eyes see all and they judge what they see. <clears throat> Matthew 3:10 and 11. Even now Jesus said the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So even right there in those two verses, we see first a fiery judgment as the tree not bearing good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. But then at the end of verse 11 that He will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. We talked earlier about trials, tribulations, struggles. Trials make you bitter or better. God allows His people to endure trials and tribulations, but not wrath. But these fiery trials are for our purification, for our strengthening. God is preparing us for eternity. 1 Corinthians 3.13, each one's work, we've read this many times here, will become clear for the day with a big D. The day of the Lord will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Our works. We will not endure fire like the, those who are consigned to hell for all eternity, but our works, they're all going to be stacked up there before God and... <laughs> He's going to flick his bick, and we'll see what's left over. You know, gold, silver, precious gems, and so forth, the things we've done here on earth, the things that we did the right things for the right reason, with the right heart before God, will be rewarded. Other things that might appear to be good on the surface may be burned away. The fire will test each one's work. Of what sort it is. Revelation 29, they went up. This is at the end of the millennium. 1,000 years. Of peace and prosperity on planet earth with Jesus on the throne. But lo and behold, there's still some people out there that have to rebel. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Do you believe they're going to try this again? A thousand years earlier, the Antichrist and the armies of the earth try to fight off Jesus. And he slays them with the sword that comes out of his mouth. You know what that is? His word. 
He doesn't have to wield the sword. He just speaks the word. They're done. They're toast. And yet a thousand years later, they're going to try to pull it again. And what happens? <clears throat> a fire came down from God. I'm laughing, but it won't be funny for them. A fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You see, God the Father will not make His dwelling place with men until after the millennium when we enter once and for all into eternity and there's no more time. We will still have time in the millennium. But once the millennium is over, time will pass away, be no more. God, will come, God the Father will come and make His habitation with us along with Jesus, along with the Holy Spirit. But here at the end of the tribulation, the saints will be there gathered in Jerusalem with Jesus and these evil, wicked men. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And we don't have to do anything. God in heaven is just going to go boom and nuke them. He is a fiery God. So you know what? You're going to experience the fire of God one way or another. So it's best to get to know Him, become His friend, embrace His Son, and that fire will provide warmth and security for you. It will purify you. It'll be a comfort to you. But if you don't know Him, there's nothing scarier than that fiery God. Revelation 20, 14, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So that's, even as our final place of dwelling will be in the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the final dwelling place of the wicked, that's what death and Hades represents, were cast into the lake of fire, the second death. Verse 15 of Revelation I don't know if we're going to make it. We'll see. Revelation 1.15, His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and His voice is the sound of many waters. So the bronze altar in the temple was related to sacrifice for sin and divine judgment upon it. And so the fine bronze, His feet were like fine bronze, representing sacrifice for sin and divine judgment as if refined in a furnace. So his feet were so bright that they seemed to be like a beautiful metal glowing intensely in the midst of a furnace. I can't wait to see him in all of his splendor and all of his glory. His voice, like the sound of many, one translation says, rushing waters. I picture the sound of the people heard when God destroyed the earth with a flood. It wasn't scary for Noah and his family because they were safe inside the ark. Or like a tsunami. We've probably all seen some films where they've depicted a tsunami or some kind of a tidal wave. The sound of those rushing waters. His voice, like the sound of many rushing waters. So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ as the God of the universe and establishes His position and authority as judge. The book of Revelation reveals the coming judgment of sin upon the earth and its inhabitants. So verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. The right hand, the seven stars, the right hand is the place of honor. Remember sitting at the right hand of the Father? The stars, many scholars, Bible scholars believe, uh, to be the angels of the seven churches. That an, an angelic being was uh, assigned over each of these seven churches, that those are the stars in his right hand. We'll explore that further when we get to the seven churches. Now, as you probably know, the word angel can mean a superhuman being, an angelic being, indicating that each church has a special guardian angel, or it may refer to the human leader, the pastor of each local church. Angel can mean simply messenger, as in one who is sent. Out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. We know that this is symbolic of the truth and the severity of the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So out of his mouth comes this sharp double-edged sword. You get to Revelation 19, 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. I mentioned he's going to strike the nations with his spoken word. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Finally, verse 21 of Revelation 19, the rest of these evil earthly armies under the guidance and direction of the Antichrist, the rest were killed with the sword which proceedeth or proceedeth from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, Jesus, and the birds were filled with their flesh. If you want to see the ultimate expression of the power of the Word of God, we see it in these verses where it talks about that sword coming out of the mouth of Christ. The power of God's Word. Verse 20 of Revelation 19 tells us the beast and the false prophet will be thrown alive into the lake of fire. The rest of the armies of the earth will be destroyed by the spoken word of Christ. And finally, we see that his face shining like the sun. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. You can see why we need our eternal, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible bodies. We would be incinerated if we stood in His presence now. He is going to be so incredible beyond what we can really imagine. We get a wonderful picture here from John, but when we see Him face to face, it's going to be words cannot describe. 1 Timothy 6.16, who alone has immortality? And so if you want immortality, which every human being wants, let's be honest, at the end of the day, we know people get discouraged, they get depressed, they want, sometimes they want to end their lives, sadly sometimes they do, but the bottom line is every human being would prefer immortality. Nobody wants to die. He alone has immortality. So the only way you can get it is to connect with Him. He alone is immortal. If you want to be immortal, and again, to live in paradise, immortality, some people think, well, if immortality is anything in this life, I don't want it. It's not. It's everything you could ever hope for, imagine, dream for, beyond everything that we could hope for immortality in Christ. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier, everyone is going to exist forever. Therefore, you only have one option, really. Unless you want to exist forever in an eternal state of torment, then you need to embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He loves you. He doesn't want you to go to hell. Hell was not created for us. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, but all who reject Christ will be going there. Who alone has immortality? And he gives it out freely to those who ask. How amazing is that? All you have to do is ask. Say, God, please forgive me for my sins. I, 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 I admit it, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please wash me with the precious blood of Christ. I confess to you that I am a sinner. Please forgive me. Please save me. Please come into my life and be my Lord and Savior, and you can be immortal in, in the best sense of the word. Dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. You know what? What we read here in 1 Timothy 16, this is exactly what we're seeing here in Revelation 1. Whom no man has seen or can see, with our physical eyes right now in these perishable bodies, we can't stand before Him. We would be incinerated. But thanks be to God, He's given us this vision, this image of Jesus in all of His glory right here in the book of Revelation. Isn't that awesome? 
This is the Jesus, by the way, that you and I will see one day very soon. Let's stand. We made it. Awesome. Covered a lot of ground. Father God, thank you so much. What a blessing to be together again and to worship you together, praise you, study your word. Father, we can't really have any up-close personal ministry time now, so I'm just going to pray. I'm going to ask anyone here this morning if you have a special prayer need that you just raise your hand for a moment, and we will acknowledge that before the Lord. I see several people. Okay, Father. Lord, you see those hands. Lord, you know what's going on with each one of them. Lord, it might be a prayer request for themselves. It might be for someone else. It could be for health. It could be for salvation. Lord, you know. You know each heart. And I know the ones that raise their hands, and so I'm thinking of them now. And I ask you just to answer those prayers, Father. Lord, you told us to ask, to seek, to knock, and that you'd be faithful to hear our prayers. And so I lift each one up to you now and ask you just to answer those prayers, Father, for your sake and for your glory. And I pray for our entire congregation that you would keep everyone safe and healthy, healthy, and that we'd be able to continue to grow in numbers as we meet now. Lord willing, week after week, Lord, we're going to be back together. We pray that our numbers would grow once again and that you would keep us safe and healthy. And Lord, that you would help our state, our governor, Lord, give them wisdom, guidance, the leaders of our state, as well as our nation, that, our, that the cities across our nation could reopen as soon as possible, Lord. Many livelihoods are being destroyed right now, Lord. There's much destruction that goes above and beyond the virus. Lord, we know the enemy, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, to destroy, but you've come that we have, might have life, and life more abundantly, Lord. I pray that you would return our nation to that abundant life as soon as possible. Lord, that you'd help these businesses to survive, that you'd help these employees who have lost their jobs to be able to make ends meet, that you'd provide, Lord, for them. And we pray that you would use this time, what the enemy intends for evil, you would use it for good and you would draw many people to Christ. You would give us opportunities to talk about you, to share our faith, and lead those who are being prepared by your Holy Spirit to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, we ask that you keep us safe on our way home, and we thank you again for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.